Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be back again in Vienna and apologize for my talk, which may be rather similar to one that some of you might have heard if you were, if you were here when I gave my talk last time. So it will be on the same topic, although certain things have happened since then. I should also apologize that the equations that I want to talk about don't feature very strongly in the talk. In fact, it would be nice to know more about them. So I would say that this is partly a talk to try and encourage people to come up with the right equations, because there is some un uncertainty about exactly what equations one should use. And uh, what I'll say will not depend very strongly on that. It will depend only on certain general features, which I think are what we need. Anyway, so let me start by uh, saying what it's about. And it's about cosmology. And here we have a picture of the universe. Of course, it's a space-time picture. And of course, I can't draw the spatial dimensions. Uh, but you have to imagine that there are three spatial dimensions. And also, I have to explain what all the frilly stuff at the back is. That's just that uh, I'm not going to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe is open or closed. So these are spatial sections, and it's easier to draw the picture if the universe is closed, but I don't want to imply that it is, although there are certain things about the equations which do seem to work better if it's at least not hyperbolic in the large. So, uh, on, but actually in detail what I'll say, it doesn't really make any difference, the spatial curvature. As I say, it does feature in the equations at a certain point. I'll say something more about that um, later on. Now, one thing about the universe that I find is surprisingly not mentioned by cosmologists when they talk about the big problems about cosmology, and this thing is, of course, something, well, it's what I sometimes refer to as the mammoth in the room. Uh, maybe it's even bigger than that, a diplodocus in the room or something. Uh, the question has to do with the Big Bang. Uh, I got interested in these issues a long time ago when um, Stephen Hawking and I got concerned with proving that singularities were very general in cosmology. And I sort of wondered, why don't cosmologists consider more general cases than this case here, which looks, at least if you ignore the frilly part at the back, looks very much like a Freeman-Robertson-Walker type of model where you assume symmetry and uh, all the cosmology seems to depend on that. Of course, there's a good reason for that, because those were the only cases they could solve. And if you have a lot of symmetry, then, of course, you can solve the equations, or solve them much more easily. Uh, of course, you could do a lot more with computers, but uh, they weren't available at that time for doing this sort of thing. Uh, and it always struck me as uh, rather surprising that these models seem to work so well. In fact, I kept saying, well, I remember talking to Jim Peebles and said, why don't people consider these much more general cases? He said, well, the observations show that it is very symmetrical. And uh, this means that people sort of don't rather ignore one of the big problems. Well, let me tell you what the big problem is that I'm talking about. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics it says that as time progresses, then the entropy goes up. In other words, the universe gets more and more random as time goes on. Well, OK seems to be sensible in a certain sense. Uh, but suppose you phrase that in, in exactly the opposite way. You say, well, what happens as time goes backwards in time? As the entropy goes down and down and down. So that means the initial state must be something extremely special. But then you have these observations. And this is one of the first things that people saw when satellites went, this is the COBE satellite, went and looked at the cosmic microwave background. It's one of the of course, one of the most important reasons for believing in the Big Bang is that you have this cosmic microwave background, this radiation from all directions, which seems to indicate that there was an extremely hot initial state of the universe. And this is consistent with the predictions that people made while assuming you had a model, which is like Friedman, Roberts, and Walker. But what's this curve telling you? Well, this curve is the... Um, uh, when you measure the frequency of the cosmic microwave background radiation this way and then the intensity this way, you get something which 
is very, very close fit to the Planck curve. In fact, the error bars, you'll see these lines here, are in the picture exaggerated by a factor of 500. So if you really put the error bars as they actually are, they would be inside the thickness of the ink line. So this is an extraordinarily precise measurement of uh, a Planck spectrum seen out there. And what does that tell us? It tells us what we're looking at is thermal equilibrium. Well, that's the mammoth in the room, because what's thermal equilibrium? Well, of course, the universe is expanding, so you have to worry about the fact it's not actually equilibrium, but it's still an adiabatic expansion, and Tolman understood these things a long time ago, and, and so the entropy is, is basically constant as in the models as, it incre uh, as time increases. Um, and you have this big problem, although the entropy is still increasing, the main evidence you have of the Big Bang is something which tells you we've got thermal equilibrium. Isn't that a paradox? You, you go back and back in time when the entropy should be going down and down, and you find it ends up as a maximum. Uh, and you don't have to be much of a mathematician to worry about a thing like that. So, uh, of course, the universe, as I said, is expanding, but that is, for very clear reasons, not the answer. The answer is that what you're looking at when you're looking at a spectrum is... Uh, radiation coming from basically matter and radiation in equilibrium, and it's telling you that that is at a maximum entropy state. What else is there? What else is there is the, is the geometry. So the geometry is what's very special. The universe is extremely uniform in the early stages, and it is very close to a Freeman-Robertson model. Uh, Robertson-Walker model. You have a universe which you, we observe to be very isotropic, homogeneous in, in the early stages. The microwave background doesn't, doesn't, doesn't just have that curve. If you look all the way around in the sky, you see the temperature variations are very small, something like uh, one part in 100,000 as you go all the way around. So uh, that is um, something indication that, again, you might think that's an indication of high entropy. But when you think about gravity, it's the other way around, because gravity has a tendency to clump things, and you have stars, galaxies, and stars, and things, and when they, get, then when they clump into a star, you have a hot spot in a dark sky, and that's a complete um, imbalance, that's what we live off, and that is where things go. It's the clumping of the matter as time goes on, and so you have this extraordinary imbalance between the matter and radiation on the one hand, which seems to be completely thermalized, and the gravity on the other hand, which is set at a very low entropy state. Now that is what I say is the mammoth in the room. It's, it's a huge puzzle. And you look at, or you know, cosmologists might list all the current fundamental puzzles of cosmology. It's not even mentioned. You see all the other things that might, you might worry about. Well, I suppose sometimes people have the idea that the reason the universe is so uniform has this thing is because of this thing called inflation. Now, you might say, where is inflation in the picture? Well, if it were in the picture, and if it's to scale, it would be tucked into that little black spot, and you would not see it. Uh, on the other hand, um, it might have effects which smooth the universe out. That's what people seem to think. But that doesn't do it. And it's easy to see it doesn't do it. And this is what they usually think of as an argument the other way around. You imagine time is going the weather around, and you have a collapsing universe. In that collapsing universe, you introduce irregularities. Those irregularities, as the universe gets more and more dense, will condense into black holes. These black holes will congeal with each other, and you will have one incredible mess at the end, which looks like something like this. Well, it doesn't look like that, I suppose, but in general terms, something like that. A great mess, which is nothing like the singularity that you seem to have closely at the beginning. And whether you put the inflaton field in, this is some field that has to be introduced in order to make inflation work, um, it's nothing. You see, I was, felt very unhappy about the artificialness of this field that's introduced. Not only that, even if you introduce that field, it doesn't stop this happening. And it can't, because the entropy is going to be going up. And the entropy is going up. The main way it manifests itself is in black holes. And those have, by far, they dominate the entropy in the universe by an absolutely enormous factor. Even now, in our universe, which doesn't look like that, it looks more like this, but the black holes that are present easily, by a huge factor, dominate the entropy in the universe. So. Um, that's using up the potential which is there in the universe being initially very uniform and, it, and it's producing black holes 
is representing the increase in entropy, which is a big factor, a huge factor. OK, so it's, it's inflation doesn't do that. However, there are other reasons for inflation. So, and I want to come to those later on. I mean, I've always been a skeptic about inflation. It seemed to me uh, I didn't quite see why you needed it. And, but there are reasons. Uh, there are a lot of bad reasons. One of the bad reasons is to make the uniforms flat. It doesn't do that, as you can see from that example. It simply doesn't do it. Um, it does do other things. One of the things that it's used for is the fact that when you look at these fluctuations in the temperature, as you look around the cosmic microwave background, as I say, one in 10 to the fifth sort of scale of fluctuation, you see there is a kind of scale invariance in that. So when you look at a small scale, it looks very similar to a large scale. And people didn't have any good explanation for that before thinking about inflation. So that inflation has a role to play there. But it seemed, always seemed to me a very unsatisfactory picture. Let me make this picture look more satisfactory, at least to me. To me, the picture looks more satisfactory if I think of it in a conformal way and think of using two conformal tricks, uh, which is one of them is to squash down infinity into a nice uh, conformal boundary. We've heard about these things this morning. Uh, and the other opposite converse trick is to stretch the Big Bang out and make it look like a three-dimensional hypersurface. So those are two mathematical tricks. And they're handy tricks, and they will both apply if you, for example, take the Friedman Robertson Walker type of model, and you can apply that to the Big Bang, and so on. So these are nice ways of looking at the universe. And let's say that's what we're doing, looking at the universe in a, in a nice way. I'm not saying too much about the physics for the moment. Um, there is, however, an issue here when you worry about the logical status of these two things. If we think about the future, then Helmut Friedrich has nice theorems about this and tells you that if you have massless radiation or something, uh, it's a generic situation to be able to introduce a conformal boundary in the future. So that's no great surprise if you can do that. What about the other one? It's completely the opposite. It's an absolutely enormous constraint on the Big Bang that you should be able to apply this trick. In fact, that is Paul Todd's way of expressing the special nature of the Big Bang, that this trick works. I'll say more about that shortly. But as far as we know, just for, there's nothing outrageous about saying, OK, we can do both those tricks. First of all, in the future, because we have nice theorems, and in the past, because it does seem to be something which is in accord with the way the universe was at the Big Bang for whatever reason. Now, here's where it gets outrageous, on the other hand. Uh, I have the claim, or the idea, that what we see in that picture is what I would call one eon. Oh, that's the universe that we were just seeing a minute ago. That's our universe, if you like, our eon. And what I'm claiming is that if you apply these conformal mathematical tricks, stretching out the Big Bang, squashing down infinity, then this will meet smoothly onto a, what I call another eon. So I'm saying that if this makes physical sense, this is our eon. There was an eon prior to ours. There was one prior to that. There will one be after ours, and there will one be after that. And the whole thing will fit together smoothly as a conformal manifold. So that is the conjecture. That is the contention. And uh, if uh, you do have this matching, then of course you certainly have Paul Todd's way of expressing the condition on the Big Bang that the gravitational degrees of freedom are hugely suppressed. It's just a hypothesis, but OK, it's a nice hypothesis. I used to phrase this thing more in the, what I used to call the vial curvature hypothesis to say that at, at singularities, at past type singularities, uh, the vial curvature, the conformal curvature, should go to zero. Uh, of course, it's a little bit awkward because when you have a singularity, it may be a problem saying what you mean by the vial curvature. So you have to say it in some kind of limiting sense. And once you're driven into that, you might as well do it in the way Paul does it, which is a much neater geometrical way of expressing the same thing. OK, but that's geometry, and it's a hypothesis. And let me try and say more about this in physical terms. Does it make sense in physical terms? Well, you see, why should we be saying 
that the conformal geometry is, uh, if you like, what we need at the crossover between one eon and the next. Well, if we go back to the single eon, um, why do we say that in the remote future, the conformal picture makes good physical sense, and in the remote past, it makes good physical sense? Well, first of all, let me say something about general relativity, and one of the reasons why it is such a precise theory. I mean, uh, in the old days, I remember there was a very nice article by Poincaré where he tried to make out that it didn't really matter what geometry you used because it was all um, artificial anyway, and you might have rulers which behaved in different ways and so on. And the only reason for preferring a Euclidean geometry is that it was the simplest. And that was the argument. And we now know from general relativity that that argument isn't a very good one. But the main reason it isn't a very good one, not because we have really good rulers, and that's what Poincaré was talking about, because he was talking about they might get stretched and squashed depending on what the temperature was or something, but we have incredibly good clocks. And the reason we have very good clocks, and clocks, if you like, once you have good clocks, you have good rulers. In fact, now we, the Paris, the meter rule in Paris is by no means any good. Well, I mean, it's, it used to be good as a good definition of the meter, but it's no good anymore because it's not nearly accurate enough, whereas we have clocks of tremendous precision. And the basic reason we have clocks of tremendous precision is the two most fundamental uh, equations of 20, here equations, equation of 20th century physics, Einstein's E equals mc squared, of course, and Max Planck's E equals h nu, where nu is the frequency. If you put the two together, that, and forget about the constants, they're just constants after all, uh, this tells you that mass and frequency are equivalent. So if you have some kind of stable particle, a quantum particle, it is a clock. It's an incredibly precise clock because just by Planck's formula, it is a frequency. I mean, it has a, if it's got a well-defined mass, it's got a well-defined frequency. Um, well, I say mass is an energy by Einstein, and energy is a frequency by Planck. So, so if it's a well-defined mass, it has a well-defined frequency. So any stable particle is an excellent clock. And here's this sort of picture. If you don't have mass, uh, say if you have massless particles running around and nothing, nothing with mass, then um, you have no way of measuring the, the surfaces which give you the times, the different ticks of identical clocks as they go through this point, those hyperboloid, hyperboloidal surfaces. But if you imagine that you don't have any massive clocks, you've just got massless things, they just go along the light cone, and the light cone is all you have. So if you have no mass, this is sort of converse to what I was just saying, if you have mass, you have wonderfully good clocks, but if you have no mass, uh, you have the light cones, but you don't have the clocks. So under what circumstances do you have no mass? <clears throat> well. In the very remote future, uh, it will be dominated very completely, almost completely, by photons. Either you'll have photons from stars, which are still running around, from the cosmic microwave background photons, or from black holes, which will, well, I should say this is what will be around in the remote future. Uh, here I have a picture of what's around in the remote, remote future. This is the some body or star, collection of stars or a star or something collapsing to become a black hole. This is a space-time picture of the black hole with the black cones drawing, drawn. Eventually, this thing, when the universe cools, it has a temperature by the Hawking uh, temperature for a black hole, and that temperature is lower if the hole is bigger, higher if it's smaller, and uh, it's still very low for the smallest black holes we know. It used to be comparable with the best the lowest temperatures that could be made on the Earth. I think probably we get, get lower ones now, but anyway, um, those are the stellar mass black holes and things like that. But you have supermassive black holes, and when the temperature of the ambient universe goes down to less than the Hawking temperature of the black hole, it starts to radiate away, and it loses mass in the form almost entirely of photons. So again, we have almost entirely photons. At the very end, we don't really know what happens, but there should be uh, well, what I've indicated is a pop. It's only a relatively small uh, explosion right at the end, something like a, a sizable artillery shell. Of course, it gets, there's a lot going out just before that, which could be compared with an atomic bomb, if you like. <clears throat> but anyway, on an astrophysical scale, it's something very small. Most of the radiation is carried away 
in the form of photons again. So if you think of what's mostly there, it's photons, and photons have no mass, and so therefore this picture of thinking of treating infinity as simply containing only massless things is a pretty good approximation. I would like to go further than that because it seems to me that if the scheme that I'm talking about is to make real physical sense, something's got to happen to electrons. And electrons, are, they're not going to evaporate away unless you have something less massive than an electron. And there can't be massless charged particles around now for various reasons which have to do with quantum field theory and um, pair annihilation and so on. So there can't be massless charged particles around now. But what you could have is a gradual decay. I said how wonderful clocks are, but maybe if we're talking about over time scales comparable with the cosmological constant and things like that, or more than that, and I will be talking about such things, then you might consider that the mass could fade out in the remote future. And this is what a hypothesis which I am making, so that maybe you need to get rid of all the mass. And I said, you could say, well, what about electrons annihilating with positrons or something? That doesn't work because in the remote future they will get isolated from their partners and uh, they're from reasons of horizons and so on. And so that won't, that won't help you. So there should be these charged particles are wrong in the, in the remote future. The conjecture, conjecture here is that mass in the very, very remote future will fade away. And so I'm assuming that. That's one of the big assumptions. I've heard it said that that's the uh, <coughs> largest, biggest um, artificial or something assumption in the theory. Well, I don't mind if that's the biggest one. There may be some others. Um, but what about the Big Bang? Well, you see, the Big Bang is really the opposite story, because there you have, well, before I, I get to the Big Bang, let me draw my picture for the remote future. Here we have a picture of the conformal boundary, the remote future. I should say space-like, because you have a positive cosmological constant. This thing would not work without a positive cosmological constant. So you have to have a space-like future boundary. Um, and uh, the idea is that the mass does decay away in, in the remote future. <clears throat> OK. Um, what about the past? Well, in the past, we get back to these sort of bio-curvature hypothesis and things like that, and Paul Todd's nice way of talking about it. Um, but here, you see, it's physically reasonable because the temperatures get higher and higher and higher and higher the closer you get into the Big Bang, and the, mo the more and more irrelevant the rest mass of particles becomes. So if everything does, in effect, become massless in the limit. You could say that the Higgs, when you exceeded the Higgs mass, then things become massless. That's not all clear the together clear to me, because you have mass from other. It depends on which particle physicist you talk to. But um, there some, seem to be other things involved in the mass. But whatever they are, you, they will disappear when you get to the Big Bang. And so the idea is, again, this uh, proposal will make physical sense. And so the thing is that you then say, well, what was before the Big Bang? It was the remote future of the previous eon. You might take the view it was a collapsing universe of some sort. That might be the most natural to think, thing to think of here, that it was some collapsing universe. And there are other models of pre-Big Bang schemes for example, um, <coughs> uh, Steinhardt and Turok have a model like that. But it seems to me they don't get around the problem that you have black holes and this great mess that I started with uh, right at the beginning of my talk when I was showing you the, the horrible sort of thing that you would expect to end up with in a collapsing universe. And how do you match that if your entropy is going in the same direction? You might say, well, perhaps it goes in both directions away from the Big Bang. Of course, you could say that, but then there's no explanation for anything, because it means you've got this extraordinarily special state stuck there in the middle for no apparent reason. Whereas here, the idea is that you naturally have a nice boundary from the remote future, and you, therefore, if, you, if the model is of that kind, with a, a big bang arising from a remote future, then you have the uh, entropy problem resolved. Or you might say, do you? Because there is a question here, which one has to face, clearly enough. If I have a model of the universe, which is in this sense cyclic, as I'm having here, 
I mean, it's not symmetrical in time, but it's cyclic in the, in the general sense. It repeats itself. I'm not saying it exactly repeats itself. I'm certainly not saying that. I think you run into paradoxes if that happens. I'm just saying that the general trend is the same from eon to eon, and that uh, this picture is the sort of thing we have. But then you might argue, well, what about entropy? Surely the entropy should be going up and up and up and up and up and up. Well, the answer, that did worry me for a while, I have to say, but it seems to me that the answer lies in something which is highly disputed amongst physicists, and I should perhaps come to that. Uh, well, I don't know if you can read all that. Let me, let me just explain it. <clears throat> um, the first point I, a point I made a little bit earlier is where is the maximum entropy in the universe today? Well, it's in black holes. What happens to the black holes? Well, they eventually uh, fade away by Hawking evaporation and disappear with a pop each. Um, well, then people say, well, you, Hawking originally said information is lost in this process. And if you look at the conformal diagrams, as what the way I would look at things, then it looks pretty obvious that information is lost. The singularity is a space-like thing, and that things just run into it. And yes, it's lost. Of course, a lot of physicists don't like that, and Stephen Hawking, I should say, changed his mind at a certain point, unfortunately. I guess it's fortunate if you want to hold whichever view you like, because then you can say you have Stephen Hawking on your side, whichever way around it is. But uh, my view was that he was closer to being right the first time, and he shouldn't have changed his mind. Now, the reason that people don't like information loss, which is what happens when the original picture of Stephen Hawking was presented, um, and if you, as I say, you've got the space-like singularity, which things just run into, and, and what happens to them? Uh, is they disappear. Uh, it, the problem that physicists have with that is that an overall picture is non-unitary. You have to have something which is unitary, so the view goes. And the reason for that is that people believe that quantum mechanics... Well, you see, I have this trouble with quantum mechanics. And the quantum mechanics, in my view, is a self-inconsistent theory because it involves two ideas which are inconsistent with each other. One of them is unitary evolution, and you don't lose information in unitary evolution, and the other is what you use your quantum state for, in other words, to work out probabilities, and in a measurement, you make a measurement which does one thing or another with certain probabilities, and that is not unitary. It makes one choice between these two things. So if you want to stay unitary, you have to say, in some sense, you believe all these different alternatives uh, coexist in some grand superposition, which is the many worlds interpretation, which I can't say I like very much. Uh, the other view you see in my, in my view, the only other thing you could sensibly say is that unitarity is violated. And that's what you see anyway in actual uh, experiments when you see the quantum state evolves and then it does this thing rather than a superposition. It does this or that or that. And doing this or that or that is a vi violation of unitarity. And then you run into all these problems that philosophers have and so on. <clears throat> it seems to be the resolution of the problems has to be that unitarity, when in a gravitational context, and that's what I say, it, is likely to be violated. <coughs> I have various reasons which I've put forward at various times. I think the one that I like the best is uh, described in my book, Fashion, Faith, and Fantasy, uh, which is more or less a picture like this, where you have two ways of looking at a quantum experiment where you want to consider that the Earth's gravitational field is to be taken into consideration. And I have here some crazy looking experiment with gravitational field taken into consideration. There are two ways you might do it. If you're an ordinary physicist, probably what you would do is you'll put a term in your Hamiltonian corresponding to the Newtonian potential and forget about Einstein and just go ahead. You wouldn't run into any inconsistency then. You just, you just do it. That's ordinary quantum mechanics. But if you believe in the Einsteinian perspective, which is to say, no, the gravitational field is equivalent if you have a uniform field like that of the Earth, to a good approximation, that uniform field is equivalent to an acceleration, and therefore you can consider your apparatus or your measuring your frame of reference as falling freely, 
and then you do your experiment without any gravitational field, or you do your analysis of the experiment, if I should say, without any gravitational field, and then you transform back. You get something which is almost equivalent. You get the Newtonian way, you get one wave function. The Einsteinian way, you get another wave function, and uh, you find then there is a phase factor connecting the two. You say, that's fine, we don't care about phase factors. But you ought to care about this phase factor, because if you look at it, you see it involves the time cubed at a certain point, which is, but roughly speaking, that you must be in a different vacuum. These are different vacua. And it's even worse when you consider a gravitating body in a superposition of two states. If you consider each one from the Einsteinian perspective, you find that your superposition involves cheating because you have to find a superposition between two different vacua, and that's illegal. Now, my view is that the illegality, I take the Einsteinian view, we know that general relativity works extraordinarily well now, and uh, I don't want to throw out the principle of equivalence, not at this stage. So it seems to me that if you want to keep it, you're in trouble with quantum mechanics. But then if you want to estimate when this trouble comes in, you can get an estimate of how long a superposition should last if it involves a displacement of gravitating bodies. And the argument is, comes down to more or less this, at least in the Newtonian limit, you work out the gravitational self-energy of the difference between these two mass distributions. And that gravitational self-energy of that difference, negative in some places, positive in other places, that's the thing I call EG, and the time scale for the existence of that uh, is reciprocally related to e this EG. There are experiments which have been going on for a long time to see if this is actually true or not. They haven't got to that yet. I'm hoping that within the foreseeable future, such experiments will be performed, and I hope they will confirm that the superposition can't last for longer than the time scale specified by this formula. Um, OK, that was a bit of a long story. I was saying it partly because I wanted to talk about it later. But um, I hope I don't get myself out of order here, which I may have done. Um, just to go back to the Hawking picture, I mean, it's not the Hawking picture, the old Hawking. Well, it's not even that, really. This is if you have an evolution where, see, what happens? You have a picture like this. Let's go back to this here. And you say the entropy is going up and up and up. And then you have a black hole formed. It's going up and up and up. The black hole evaporates away. It's going up and up and up. Disappears. The trouble is, if you've lost information, you say, well, maybe the entropy's still gone up, but part of the information which defines the phase space has gone. And so why should I be using that same phase space? You think, well, no, that's stupid phase space to use. I should use the phase space which is smaller than that, where those degrees of freedom that have been swallowed by the black hole are not now considered. So that is the argument, and this is the sort of cartoon of what's happening. You have a phase that's meant to be a phase space, when you consider the black hole has gone and the degrees of freedom have gone, you reduce the phase space to a smaller one, and your evolution gets projected down into a smaller one. So the thing, and then this is the sort of space-time pictures to show why I do think information has to be lost. But let's not worry too much about that. Anyway, so that's the picture, is it's never that the entropy goes down, it's just that you change your mind about what phase space you're using in order to define the entropy. And so that when you have gone, all the black holes have now disappeared, and those black holes, as I said before, represented by far the most entropy in the universe. Once you've taken that out of your consideration of what the entropy is, then the entropy has gone down to the value that it will be at the next eon. And so it's the second law, in a certain sense, is not violated in this scheme. It's what I think John Wheeler would have called transcended, that uh, the second law has to be taken, you say, with respect to what phase space? And now the phase space that you're using is a much smaller phase space. And so it can still be consistent with the second law going up all the time, entropy going up all the time. So that is the picture I have. Of course, these things require looking at it with much more detail, and uh, they do. That's one of the things. Well, the next question here is, is this model true or not? Well, that's a big question. Is it just a, an idea which nobody can see one way or the other? Well, I'm not going to go into detail for this. Um, I claim that there is evidence for it. 
and the evidence comes from this sort of thing I'm visualizing in this picture here. This plane represents the crossover between pre pre previous eon and the succeeding eon, and this is us in this later eon, and we have a couple of supermassive black holes running into each other, bang, they produce this, well, it won't sound like a bang because it's gravitational waves, and those gravitational waves will go up until they meet the crossover surface, and then they produce a signal. I'll come to what kind of a signal is a question I want to talk about in a moment. So they produce a signal, and that signal, uh, I claim, would be observable as certain rings in the cosmic microwave background. Now, my Armenian colleague, Vahe Guzajan, did do an analysis of this, a lot of people were skeptical of his analysis originally. Um, I think uh, the way it was done in the last paper that we wrote together, I, I haven't really heard any complaints about it. Certainly his pictures have been confirmed by other people, and they do seem to indicate the presence of these rings. Um, a much more careful analysis was done by a Polish group headed by uh, Christoph Meisner and Pavel Nerowski and Daniel Ann, and they are still trying to get their paper through in the astrophysical journal with new kinds of complaints to them each time it comes back from referees and then they deal with them and new complaints come by. And I have no idea what the stage is. I can't see why it hasn't been published. Um, but that seems to indicate from looking at it a different way, but the same signals as I'm playing here. And if they're not there, we have a real puzzle in particular because you could see where these rings are and they're not at all uniform across the sky. The centers of these rings are concentrated in certain regions and how you can get that from the conventional explanation, which I didn't talk about, what is the conventional explanation for the cosmic microwave temperature variations? Well, it's that you have inflation and the inflation, there's this thing called the infraton field, which is needed to drive the inflation and that infraton field is supposed to um, produce uh, quantum fluctuations, and these quantum fluctuations, for some reason, become classical fluctuations in a way that's not explained, and those are supposed to see what we see. What's good about it is that you do seem to get the scale invariance. Now, I'm not going to talk about the, the uh, black hole encounters and the evidence there, because I really want to talk about the other thing. Um, well, I should talk about the equations, really, because that's what's in the uh, lecture. How do we get... Okay, let's come back to that. Equations. Well, the main thing I want to talk about is something which puzzled me a long time ago, and I couldn't... It just seemed to me a strange mathematical puzzle. And it's expressed here. We have the conformal curvature the Weyl curvature, which I use the letter C for, the conformal curvature, and that is clearly a conformally invariant entity. It's a conformal thing. And that can be used to measure the gravitational degrees of freedom. And that's, I like to look at it that way. The conformal curvature describes the gravitational degrees of freedom. Like if you like Maxwell's equations, you have the free Maxwell field, and you have the source for the Maxwell field, there are different orders of differentiation in Maxwell's theory. In Einstein's theory, you've got the source, which is the Ricci tensor, and the free field, which is the Weyl tensor. Okay, they're the same differential order, but that's to do with the spin and so on. That's okay. But if you just think of it that way, that is to say, you're thinking as, as the Weyl curvature being propagated through space, and you look at the equation. Well, the way I looked at it is to think of it in, t in terms of two component spinners. I won't throw this at you here because that's a different notation which people may not be familiar with. But the um, <clears throat> two spinner notation makes it clear that the Maxwell equations and the Bianchi identities written in the two spinner notation for the Weyl curvature are just the same equation just with more indices. Or the Weyl neutrino equation, if there were no mass, the same equation. Or you have massless equations for any helicity, any spin, and they're just the same equation with more indices. And they're all conformally invariant. So that if you have a painted on a space-time with a conformal boundary, you can see what happens to the conformal boundary by following that field. And it doesn't really notice the conformal boundary. That's the way I tended to look at these things. You've got a conformal boundary to space-time, and the gravitational field looked at from that point of view it's propagating this massless field, it will be finite on that boundary. However, 
They're both conformally invariant equations, but it's a different conformal factor. So I'm calling the K is the free field propagation of the vial curvature, if you like, the conformal invariance of that, which is going to be finite at infinity because it just chugs along and it doesn't even notice infinity much. It says, oh, well, just here's another boundary. What's, what's it for? So it, it just goes straight through. But the vial curvature has a different conformal factor. So that goes to zero. So this is telling us already something a little bit stronger than we got from Paul's original conjecture or way of looking at the Big Bang because he was saying the vial curvature has to be finite at the boundary, but here it has to be zero because if it's got to match the previous one and it's zero, it's infinity because the conformal factor goes to infinity, what it was just this previous picture. So the vial curvature has to go to zero if the the free waves have a finite value there, and that's what they should have. So therefore, you have to match the zero with the zero on the other side. And so the vial curvature hypothesis of having zero vial curvature is implicit in this picture. Okay, so that's an important thing that I want to say. However, there is a question here, is what happens to those degrees of freedom? The degrees of freedom have to propagate across the crossover. Now, just a quick thing here. This is just saying what I just said, basically. The other thing I want to say is something which I sort of said. If you have a cosmological constant, positive means space-like, and zero is what I always used to believe in before being persuaded that it seemed to be positive. Uh, zero is the case that uh, we used to work with normally, and uh, negative is what the string theorists like. Uh, it seems to be positive. It, Positive is central for the conformal cyclic cosmology. Okay, so we have that. And here we have the... I can't spend much time on the equations. I don't intend to any of it. Let's say it quickly. Here is a picture of how you would do it. Here we have a crossover surface and you have a conformal factor, which I use a big omega for, up to here, and then a little omega, what happens over there. And then I say, I'm going to make a hypothesis, which is the... Um, reciprocal hypothesis, which is to say that the big omega is minus the reciprocal of the little omega. That's not too much of a statement until you make some more restrictions on things. <clears throat> but let me not worry about that for the moment. That's a bit of how one looks at this philosophically. The big omega, if you think of using Einstein's equations down here, you want to write your equations. It's nothing different from Einstein. It is just the Einstein's equations. But you're writing the equations in which you consider that boundary. And the way you do that is introduce this big omega. And that big omega is a phantom field, if you like. It doesn't have any physical role. You could just scale it away, scale it back to one, and then you're back in the Einstein scaling, or scale it to something which goes infinite, and you can keep the metric finite at the boundary. It's just a trick. But if you imagine it was a sort of a field, it has an energy momentum tensor, which is this thing down here with the D being defined on that line there. And it's quite nice the way the Einstein equations with cosmological constant come out. You say you take this sort of energy momentum tensor of this phantom field, and it's equal to the energy momentum tensor of the other fields taken to be conformally invariant in this remote enough limit. So that's the picture I have. That is the Einstein equations. Very neat in this form. Now. I'm going to say that when we have the reciprocal hypothesis, it changes the way we look at omega. It makes it look much more like an actual field on this side. And the equations behave now as though instead of being something that's equal to t, it adds into t. There's a sort of subtle sign, sign change which comes in. And so it becomes something else which is added into the old fields. You might hear say there are Maxwell fields and Yang Mills fields which are going through, they come through on the other side and they're still there. But you have to add something else. That's not going to work if you didn't have some huge contribution added into it. And that huge contribution comes from the omega field looked now as a real field because of the reciprocal hypothesis. It now behaves like a real field. And that real field, what is it? Well, the claim is, what it is, is dark matter. Now, you see, dark matter, nobody really knows what it is, so you can say anything. So what I'm saying is that dark matter is this new field. And I've said this for quite a long time. 
Now, what's a little bit new, however, well, what's slightly new is uh, and what I was saying last time I was in Vienna, and what is a little bit more new is what I'm going to say now. Um, but before I do it, I can't, I have to apologize that I can't really see what I've written on my transparencies. So I'll put it up here and just sort of assume what I'm saying corresponds to what's written there. Uh, as you can see it written there. I'm basically saying that there is a new field. It would pick up a mass at a, some, some stage. You need to have some conditions on the, uh, to make the crossover unique. And that's where there are some questions about what, exactly what equations you have. It looks like something like the following. You put some conditions on the derivatives of the, of the little omega as you go away. Little omega is smooth as you go away from the crossover. Big omega is infinite to the crossover. Little omega is smooth, and you can look at its, its derivatives away from the surface. And use that as a sort of initial data for uh, a sort of Yamabe-type equation for the little omega field. Um, and you need to have two numbers. Well, the first two are no good to you because they're already fixed for you. So it's a bit like if you have the wave equation and you want to say, what's the initial data on the surface for a wave equation? Usually you say, well, you take the field and it's normal derivative. But suppose you can't do that. Suppose you're supposed to say, take the first derivative and the second derivative, or the second and third derivative. Then what do you have? Well, you almost have enough information in a certain sense but if you say take the first and second derivative, you could add in any solution of Laplace equation, and that would still not change the data. And uh, that wouldn't be a, shows the solution is not unique. But it is very much restricted. So you have to have a way of cutting down that freedom. And Paul has a way of doing that using a Yamabe type equation, which may be the right way of doing it. But I'm not going to put my money on anything at the moment here. I'm just going to look at whatever this <coughs> field has to be as it comes through the other side. Well, think about it physically. I'm saying it picks up a mass. Well, that's basically saying, look, it's dark matter. It has a mass. Nobody knows what its mass is. I asked Jim Peebles what the limits on its mass were. He said, huge. It could be some very tiny thing, or it could be as mass. The particles could be as massive as the sun. He didn't believe that, but as far as the astrophysical observations are concerned, that's not a contradiction. So what am I saying? What is the mass? Well, you see, the dark matter here is really gravity in a certain form. It's sort of a chrysalis form of gravity or something. I'm not quite sure what to say. But it's carrying exactly those degrees of freedom which used to be in the gravitational field, but which, as far as vile tensor is concerned, they're killed. Well, as Paul also pointed out, if you look at the... Um, what the information is that's carried across the crossover surface, you really have to split. You see, I should say the vial curvature is zero, but its normal derivative is not zero. Its normal derivative is measuring the gravitational radiation of fields before. That's the K. The normal derivative of the vial curvature is the K. Now, that K, you split into electric and magnetic parts. The magnetic part corresponds to the, to the cotton tensor of the three surface. So the three surface is not conformally flat. It's got a cotton tensor, which is its conformal curvature. But it has also a re, uh, an electric part, and it's that electric part which converts itself into the degrees of freedom into this new field. Now, but still, it's only gravity in a sense. So if it's only gravity in a sense, well, it only, observationally, it only interacts gravitationally. Fine, that's a plus. It's only gravity, well, gravity only acts gra gravitationally, yes. Um, what mass could it have? Well, it's only gravity. So, well, I think it has to be something like a Planck mass. And according to what Jim Peebles says, and I talked to um, Joe Silk later on, and is a Planck mass plausible? Very plausible, he says, for the mass of dark matter particles. Okay, let's suppose they're Planck mass particles. If they're Planck mass particles, whatever they are, in fact, by the time you get from Big Bang to the next crossover, they should have all gone. So they decay. Now, if they decay, what do they decay into? Well, they decay into gravitational signals because that's, they're just gravity. So that's all they could be. If they had interactions with other particles, they could decay into other particles. But then it would very rapidly happen, so it's got to be just gravity. OK. Now, I mentioned the cosmic microwave background having the scale invariance, 
And where does that come from? Well, you see, I used to think, well, the only thing in CCC, conformal cyclic cosmology, is the black hole encounters and these big, big bangs. Christoph Meisner convinced me that that can't be, that it's not nearly big enough. There's got to be something else which is causing the cosmic microwave, the 10 to the minus 5 variations in temperature that we see. That's something in the eon prior to ours which is causing that, that, those temperature fluctuations. And it's something which has a scale invariance. OK, so if the decay is late enough, so it's taking part in this ex exponential expansion of the universe, then it will be like the reason people believe inflation, because then you have the scale invariance. So it's got to be mainly in that, going on in that time. I think one can get a much closer handle on this, and I have to talk to Christoph because he's much better at these things than I am, to see if one can actually get a good figure for the decay time of these particles. Now, I think uh, it's got to be something, probably like something like 10 to the 11th years, something of that sort. It's got to be a huge length of time. Now, I'm having a problem finding a transparency. Um, yeah, what did I do with it? I wanted to relate it to the previous talk, you see. What do these particles do? Well, they decay. If they're Planck, if they're just gravity, then they would have a frequency, basically, which is a Planck frequency. Now, if they have a Planck frequency radiation, then um, what would happen when they come to a gravitational wave detector? Well, the, the argument I had was a much more uh, old-fashioned argument. We saw a much better argument in the talk we just had prior to this one, which I was going to give you the other argument, but I don't know where I put it. So perhaps let me just say it. See, if you have a, a gravitational wave, which is a vacuum, and it's the sort of thing that people at LIGO are expecting to see, what's the wave look like? Well, it squashes, it does this sort of thing. Does that kind of oscillation. So the arms stretch one way and squash the other way, then they go back the other way. Now, suppose it's a very high frequency wave. So it's doing that at an enormous frequency, something like a Planck frequency. What do you see? You only see the higher order effect, the second order effect. And the way I like to look at that is thinking of lenses. Suppose you have an optical bench or something, and you're looking at lenses on an opt optical bench, and these lenses are also oscillating one on the other. Suppose you had a purely astigmatic lens and another one opposite of that. When they're up against each other, they cancel completely. If you move them apart, they behave like a positive lens, which focuses in both directions. And, and you can see that just from the formulae for, for lenses. There's the nonlinear term in that, which gives you that. So what I'm saying is, and here is my picture. I think I found it, yes. Here's the picture. If you're looking at Gravitational waves look like that. File curvature, Ritchie curvature, squashes inwards both ways. And if you have an oscillating wave, and here you have a power of a lens, if you add powers, then the distance between them contributes to the sum of the powers. And so if you have an oscillating wave, it looks like a Ritchie tensor. So there should be these pulses coming in from each time a dark matter particle. I call these aerobonds because I looked it up on. Uh, on the uh, Wikipedia, it's a bad thing to do um, because it told me there was an Egyptian god called Erebos and they didn't have a Greek god. And then later on I look again and it was a Greek god called, called Erebos. Fortunately, he has the same name. So I'm prepared to call these things er Erebons. These are the dark matter particles and their decay occurs something like once in 10 to the 11 years, something like that. And, uh, okay, that's all I'm doing with that picture. Um, now, what's the last picture? I was going to give you some figures. You see, I think I started off, if I showed you this picture, I can't remember now what I've shown you or what I haven't shown you. Did I show you that picture at the beginning? This is meant to be people, LIGO people, looking at gravitational waves coming in, and they have two detectors um, at these two different places, which are uh, a long way apart. Uh, such a distance that if a signal comes in, they, it hits one first and then the other. And uh, in the case that they were looking at, 6.9 um, milliseconds, is it? Microseconds. Uh, microseconds, I guess. Um, anyway, 
this was consistent with, see, what they look at, they look at the LIGO signal, which is some, brrr, you know, some particular very specific signal, which is calculated to look like this, and that's how they pick them out, because it has the right shape. You say, okay, that signal is seen by one, and it's seen by the other. There's a time delay between the two. That says there's a signal that's coming from a certain direction. Now, there are people in Copenhagen who had a look at this thing, too, and they looked at the noise surrounding the signal. And they found that the noise itself was correlated. Now, there's a big argument going on about this. Are they right? And the LIGO people say, no, you did it all wrong. And then the Copenhagen people say, no, the LIGO people did it wrong. And actually, the person who tried to correct them had got it wrong, so that the Copenhagen people had a point. Now, I think when I heard about this, this was, I think, the day after I gave my talk on this thing in Vienna before, um, I thought, my God, could this be the signals coming from the galaxy in which the black holes are that are being seen by the LIGO people? So black holes coming together, spiraling in, boom, like that, they have to be in the same galaxy, presumably, unless they're way out in space. So there's a galaxy there. If there's a galaxy there, there'll be a whole lot of Arab bonds in that galaxy. Those Arab bonds will be decaying, and that decay signal might be what the Copenhagen people are picking up. Now, I got very excited about this, and uh, a little too excited, probably. Well, that's what happens in all the sequence like that. Um, I got a bit excited about that, and, and I even put a thing on the archive trying to say maybe these are Erebon decays. Well, maybe they are, but that was before I started to do calculations on how many of these things there were. Now, this is my last slide here. Um, so I was trying to count and see how many you'd expect to see. Well, how many, how big is the sun in terms of how many Erebons are in the sun? I'm using Planck units here. Uh, <clears throat> So the, the numbers I've got written up there, you can probably see them. Um, <clears throat> and if you have these black holes coming together, well, imagine how much bigger than the sun they are and how much percentage of their energy goes out in gravitational radiation. It's roughly a sun, solar mass. They're, they're maybe an order of magnitude bigger than the sun, and you only get an order of magnitude less in radiation. Maybe it's a bit less than that. But you have about the mass energy of the sun coming out in the LIGO signals. Well, there are three of them, or four now, I guess. But the other one's not a black hole thing, I guess. Um, so then I try to think, well, is the galaxy they're sitting in going to produce a signal that you might see? Well, it's got an awful lot of Erebons in it, and it's, it's smaller than you would see in the black hole encounter. But is it that much smaller that you wouldn't see it? If it was just an impulse, if it was a single Erebon, Maybe you would pick that out from the, from the signal. But it's just a moosh. It's a whole galaxy with these things going off all the time. So when I thought about that, I got a bit discouraged. But then um, I had a bit of a conversation, an email conversation with Sabine Hosenfelter. And she made a suggestion, not realized, she thought it was my suggestion, but I hadn't realized it wasn't quite. So I said, well, look, it doesn't have to be you're seeing the individual Erebon decays. You might be seeing some pattern in the shape that these things are having. And she said, oh, you're looking about the uh, um, um, HBT effect. I said, what's the HBT effect? Hanbury Brown twist. Oh, I know about Hanbury Brown twist. At least I know about it. It's the way that you measure the diameter of the stars from photons coming from the stars. And at the time, they produced their arguments. People didn't, a lot of good physicists told them they were talking nonsense because it depended on photons interfering with each other, with each other. So, no, no, photons can only interfere with themselves. And so, Henry Run and Swiss said, no, no, it's wrong. They can interfere with each other because they are bosons automatically. And because they're bosons, they are one state between the two of them. And so, they automatically are entangled by the mere fact that they're bosons. So when this suggestion was made to me, I thought, my God, maybe, you see, you have these signals from different decays, but there is a correlation between them. Now, you're seeing high-frequency signals. You don't see that high frequency. But if you see those two coming together, they will interfere in different ways. So if they're correlated in some ways, you will get patterns from the galaxy as a whole. Now, I don't know how to do that calculation, but it made me much more optimistic 
that maybe there is something in looking at the Hanbury Brown twist sort of effect, it's not quite the same thing, but where you will see features in the signals come to us, which you can then match from one detector to the other detector. That's the point, you see. If you just see a moosh from one and a, and a moosh from the other, you have no idea when that's coming. But if there is some pattern, even if it's a random pattern, if that random pattern matches this random pattern, then you can get correlations. So it seems to me plausible. I, all I can say it's plausible. The only other way, there's sort of two ends to this. You can, might be able to see distant galaxies in this sort of way. You might be able to see the decays in our close ones in our own galaxy. And I sort of worked again out and sort of estimate there. And it seemed to me that the decays happen, well, I've got the figure up there somewhere, uh, very, very infrequently, each one. But if you consider, say, a light second around us, that maybe if you wait a year, you might see one of them. So it's something like that. So it, it's plausible that these things could be seen by detectors. Uh, I don't know. It needs more work. It needs more work in lots of places. We'd like to see more on the equations too. But anyway, let me leave you with that. Thank you very much.